Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my epic rant on the 2021 horror film, Censor. Now, before uh, I go any further, I want to make this clear. I know this film has a lot of fans. I know, I know there's a lot of people who really enjoyed this and thought it was one of their favorite films uh, from last year in 2021. And that's fine. I think that's great. I think that's wonderful. Uh, different opinions are what keeps this world interesting. I wanted to like this because the idea for this film, in my opinion, is really good. It's a really cool concept. But for me, it was a failure in execution. Uh, and it was such a massive failure in execution, it really upset me. It was a really infuriating film to sit through because you were watching a brilliant idea get butchered and flushed down the fucking drain. And that's a draining experience. It really is. The film is directed by uh, Prano Bailey Bond. Uh, and this is the first film that uh, she directed. She directed some short films prior to this, but this is her, her uh, directorial debut. She also wrote it along with Anthony Fletcher. And I've seen a lot of uh, other critics and other people say that the direction was impressive. It was incredible. It was really noteworthy. I thought it was unimpressive, I thought it was pretty flat, I thought it was mediocre at best. And you know what? For a first time director, that's already a good place to start. Because there's a lot of first time directors who don't even start off with middling results. They start off pretty rough, and then they start to get their stride. Uh, it's not always the case when you have a first-time filmmaker who's just amazing right off the bat. So I think there's still a lot of room to grow for, for her as a filmmaker. And I, I'm curious to see what she does next because there are some moments where she did impress me. I just didn't feel that the overall result was that impressive. For instance, when it comes to scenes that are trying to be a little bit more eerie or moody in terms of the atmosphere, I felt she did a decent job shooting those. Uh, she tended to take a little more risks in terms of what angles or what zooms or what pans or, or what kind of uh, techniques uh, she would employ. So those scenes were uh, definitely a little bit more intriguing for me or particularly noteworthy than a lot of the other scenes that I just felt were shot very flat, the very lifeless, or just very safe and just bland. That's really a great way to put it. A lot of the scenes in this film are very bland and dull, and no amount of lighting really fixes how bland and dull a lot of these sequences are appear on the screen uh there's a lot of scenes where you're just focusing too much on someone's face or some really boring uh setting or it's just one of those things where it needed to deviate a little bit more and it didn't really do that so it just got into this point got to this point where it became a little monotonous and it just became something where it would only occasionally wow you and even then when it did wow you with its visuals it still was something that was comparable to a indie horror filmmaker who had been doing uh, a handful of films for a few years so it really wasn't something that was like god damn i cannot wait to see what this director does next uh, this director is one of the uh, rising stars in the industry. No, I, I didn't. I didn't really see that at all. In fact, I've seen more impressive output from someone like Brandon Cronenberg or Panos Cosmatos in their first uh, debut films. But once again, I'm going to make this clear. She didn't do a bad job. 
it just wasn't that impressive to me uh, visually compared to a lot of the other things that I've said I've seen uh, when it comes to the direction the screenplay that is where the film really falls flat on its fucking ass really unique fun concept despite the fact that Evil Ed did do a semblance of this prior to this film's release and in my opinion Evil Ed is a better movie but this still was something that was fairly unique compared to most uh, horror films today so I give the script a lot of credit for trying to do something different instead of just giving us the same shit but that doesn't mean that I'm going to give it a pass for failing to live up to its full potential. This is a script that has a good idea, a good setting. It takes place during the heat of the video nasty era in Britain. You have the film's lead who is a censor, a film censor named Enid, who is tasked with editing out the violence in these gory films and it's starting to take a toll on her emotionally and physically and she's also dealing with other things in her life that are just piling on top of whatever she's already dealing with every day at her normal job censoring these films and then she becomes uh, embroiled in this controversy because she was one of the editor for a film that was ultimately passed and wasn't put on the band list. And some killer saw it and used it as inspiration. So now she's on people's hit lists and she's in the press and she's being uh, bad mouthed and she's dealing with more trouble at home. And you would think this this would be compelling enough, but it's not. It, it because there's a lot of stuff that just, in my opinion, just isn't as eye catching or as compelling as it could be. For instance, this drama, it's pretty standard. And if they really wanted to showcase how this is making her feel, uh. I think they could have done a better job. Like, they had some scenes where she was emotional and distraught about it, but she was already pretty emotional and distraught to begin with, or very cold and distant from the start. So, seeing her become even more cold and distant really isn't that much of a contrast compared to what she was already doing at the start of the movie. And why not show a quick scene of the killer? eating someone's face to show the violence and to show uh, how the film inspired him to do this act and then deal with the, the shock and the horror from Enid and other people uh, when it comes to the news. Instead, it's just said over uh, dialogue and you never see anything. And that, that whole angle isn't really the best either because it's dropped pretty early on like you have one other scene uh like maybe halfway through the film where it tries to it tries to insinuate that the guy never saw the film so it was all just a fabrication by the media but then it goes nowhere with that it doesn't go any further with it in terms of a uh, takedown of the media and the press so it just feels like something that was thrown in there to try to grab you but in my opinion it didn't work because of the way that it was executed and then the whole family drama I just don't give a shit about it and the only time that the film really starts to grab your interest is like over 40 minutes into the movie when Enid starts to put some pieces together in terms of what might have happened to her missing sister. And she then starts searching for her missing sister and starts believing that her missing sister might be one of these video nasty horror film stars. 
And so you have a scene where she goes to a, 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 a rental shop and gets a video nasty from behind the counter. And she watches it and she looks at the cover art and it, it looks like it's her sister all grown up. So then she starts this journey of trying to find her sister and trying to find the shooting location for this uh, horror film from the same filmmaker who did the video nasty. And this is going to be the last film role for the actress whom she thinks is her missing sister. And that leads her to going to the home of this producer who uh, ultimately dies in a way that I think is intended to be funny, but I just thought it was just kind of, eh. Like, I didn't think it was laugh out loud hilarious or anything, because he falls and he he lands on top of a, a, a horror film award and it, it, it pokes through his uh, mouth. And you're like, ha-ha, he got killed by... Uh, his own uh, work and you're like eh, whatever it just it didn't really it really wasn't that funny and then after that because she is able to find the location for the shooting she goes to the shooting for the location and that's where you get all the gore that's where you get all the horror in the film because prior to that there's barely any horror at all that's another thing about this script that is really disappointing and frustrating because it's a horror film and there's barely any fucking horror for the first half of the movie uh it's really a drama more than anything uh yeah you see some fake video nasty film footage and you see an, a, a credit sequence with all these clips from video nasties but that's not actually original horror that's set up for this story that's just clips so that doesn't count to me so you have not much except for some really lame dream sequences that just have some pink and purple and blue lights and her parents saying some generic shit over and over again and then you get to the ending where there's a little bit more gore. There's a guy who gets shot, I believe. Yeah, he gets shot in the stomach, I think. I think he gets shot in the chest or he gets stabbed or something along those lines. And then for some reason, there's like a creature inside of him. And I don't know what the fuck that was. Probably a hallucination from Enid. And Enid just goes crazy at the end. I don't think the script did a good job showcasing her descent into madness that well either. She has her moments where she's emotional and she's depressed, but it doesn't really seem like it's that believable that she goes from depressed and, and distraught and distant to desperate and going crazy and killing people on the set of a horror movie because she's trying to save her sister. Like, it just didn't seem like it was that believable for me seemed like it was a stretch and speaking of that scene this is a film for the most part it takes itself way too seriously despite the moments where it tries to be funny but then really fails at that because there's not really anything in this that i would say was funny or 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 a particularly well written when it comes to uh comedy so the only times, though, that I did laugh, because I, I would be honest, there was a, there were a few things that did make me laugh, but I don't think it was intentional. Uh, it, it was unintentional laughter because of just how absurd the ending was. Because the last 15 minutes, it just seems like the story is on fast forward. It's like, all right, here's all the gore. Here's all the uh, carnage. Here's Enid flipping out and going crazy because of the video nasties and everything that she's doing as a profession. And it's all done practically. I'll give the film that. And it's somewhat creative in some of the kills. Like she, I think, yeah, she, I think she winds up cutting a guy. She, I think she decapitates a guy at one point. Uh, there's also the scene where 
Beast Man, which that's really the moment that made me laugh. Because there's this fictional slasher villain in the series of films called Beast Man, and he looks like a Geico caveman or unfrozen caveman lawyer from SNL. Like it's just ridiculous and stupid. And so you have this scene at the end where Beast Man is attacking what who she thinks is her sister, and so she flips out and kills him. That's when you see that scene where there's like a like a mutant creature or something inside his chest, but it doesn't pop out or anything. It just set, goes peekaboo, and that's it. And that's when she kills the the director. And then the film ends with her being insane because she thinks that the the actress is her sister. Of course, you find out it's not. It's all delusion. And the filmmaker tries to do something interesting here by intercutting quick cuts and edits of scenes of her with her sister in this really hyper happy fantasy of what she wishes was reality. So she's dancing and skipping and being happy and smiling and she's got her sister in one hand and there's a rainbow in the fucking sky and she goes to her parents house and they're all waving and they're all happy and 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 just en enthusiastic that she's back and she's found her sister and then the, there would be some edits that would be uh, spliced in of her being mad and crazy and the film ends with her in her delusion of this happy rainbow world where there's rainbows in the sky and her sister is alive and she's there with her family and it's I guess it's kind of trying to say something about how she censored the reality so as a censor in when she goes mad she does an edit herself of what she thinks should be acceptable uh, and she bans the truth and I'm like I get it I understand but it's it's handled in such a way that it's so heavy-handed and so on the nose that it's just absurd and it's hard to take seriously and it ends with a videotape with the film's title being ejected from a VCR and I'm like what was this all on a, on a VHS tape did this never happen <laughs> are we are we pulling a cemetery man here where everything takes place in a snow globe but in this film everything takes place in a fucking VHS tape what the I just this is one of those films that when it's over, you're like, what the fuck was that? And wow, what a waste of fucking time. Yeah, huge missed opportunity when it comes to the script. Good idea. It takes place during the Video Nasty era. You've got uh, uh, your lead who's a film censor, but it didn't do a good job showcasing her descent into madness, at least not to me personally. And it took itself way too fucking seriously, which was the wrong move to make for this kind of film taking place in this era. It should have gone all out with the violence and the craziness and the carnage. And then at the same time, been a legitimately funny satire of how absurd and ridiculous the censors were during that time. But that's not what you get here. And as a result, you just get a concept that just fails to launch. And it's just one of those things that just really, really gets to you. Because you're like, God damn it. Like, there was so much potential here. And you just wasted it. You ejected it. And 
I just don't get it. I don't understand why the writers took the approach that they did with this. But they got a ton of praise. They got a ton of people saying it's brilliant and it's mind-blowing and it's amazing. So maybe they they did do it right. Uh, maybe I missed something, but I, I don't think I did. I got it. I got what they were trying to go for and it, it was just a misfire, a, a very frustrating aggravating misfire because it's just full of so much mispotential and even the performances really weren't that great either i mean niami algar who played enid i would say out of the actors in this film she was the one that delivered the best performance but even then it was just above average to me it wasn't a crazy good performance like other critics have made it out to be I didn't think she showed nearly as many layers or nearly as much talent. There were a lot of scenes where I felt that her acting was a, a little bit too restrained or there were moments where when she's trying to be distant, it, it just felt like she was bored. See, that's the thing. It just looked like the actress was bored instead of being distant and emotionally uh, hollow. I will say this once she does go crazy and show some emotion, that's when the performance shines. But that's the problem. There's so much of the film where she's just dead eyed and dead faced. And I get it. She's supposed to be emotionally distant, but show some fucking personality at the start, at least. That would be that would be something that can make that stand out more. You also have Nicholas Burns who plays Sanderson, Vincent Franklin who plays Frazier, Sophia Laporta who plays Alice Lee, uh, uh, Sophia, yeah, yeah, Sophia Laporta. I already mentioned her. Adrian Schiller, as Frederick North, uh, Michael Smiley as Doug Smart, Claire Holman as June. So a few other actors and actresses, but really it's mostly Niami Algar. And, like I said, she's fine, but she's not anything that's really that spectacular when it comes to her performance. So, not really a performance that's so strong that it can carry the film, at least not to me personally. And the cinematography by Annika Summerson, it was serviceable, but nothing more than that. I wasn't that impressed with the cinematography either, sorry, didn't really impress me see much better cinematography in other indie horror films. I mean, compare this to Panos Cosmatos' work in Mandy or Beyond the Black Rainbow. It's not even fucking close. And I know he didn't necessarily do the cinematography for both those films, but the cinematographer for those films did a better job. The editing is by Mark Towns. And I would say that is a highlight of the film. There are some moments where the editing is clever, like near the like at the end when she's having her psychotic break, it's edited like a uh, VHS tape that's breaking, or there are different clips that are spliced in, so you see like fuzz and static. So that was pretty uh, cool, and 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 I felt there were a lot of other uh, little editing tricks that I thought were uh, pretty noticeable and 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 pretty. Uh, uh, noteworthy and high quality uh the music was by emil levian c levinasi farouch forgettable droning synth music i've heard it a million times and it did nothing to elevate the sense of dread or atmosphere or mood in any of the scenes the film might not might as well not have had a score I, I get why they tried to go for a synth score, but if you're just going to do random synths and not try, then why even fucking bother? Really? There are so many synth wave artists that this film could have hired to do the score that would have Im improved this film immensely. But no, we're just going to hire this other composer and have her do... 80s retro synth music and 
make it sound inauthentic and lame. And speaking of inauthentic authentic and lame, one thing I want to mention about the cinematography and the direction is that despite it taking place during the 80s, it never feels like an 80s film. It never feels like one because of the lighting, because of the way that so shots are set up. Like there was no attempt to shoot the film like an 80s movie. There was no attempt to do that. Uh, a good example of something that I felt did a better job doing something like that is uh, The Final Girls. It was actually intent trying to be shot and set up in a way where it is like an 80s slasher, but with also some other contemporary modern filming techniques. But there were a lot of other moments where it, it did kind of look like an 80s slasher. Uh, another example, not necessarily 80s, but late 70s, is Halloween Kills. The direction in the prologue. That looked like it was from that era. So, I feel that there should have been more of an effort to make it look like it's from the 80s. Like, what's the point of having it take place in the 80s if it doesn't even look like it takes place in the 80s? I'm so tired of these films that take place in the past... And they half-ass it when it comes to the art direction, the production production design, like the uh, recent adaptation of it, and just throw in some 80s stuff and uh, VHS tapes and have people wear old 80s clothes and then call it a fucking day. It's lazy. Try harder. Actually, try to be authentic. And for a film that has a lot of video nasties, the, the video nasties that it shows on camera, the actual tapes and the boxes, they look like they're fake. They There are so many artists out there online that you could give the job to to make an authentic looking fake video nasty. But instead, they just have some guy or some gal cook up something in Photoshop or After Effects. And it looks fake. It doesn't look like anything from the era. So, yeah, it just was a very disappointing film in so many different ways. Because great concept, good idea, just piss poor execution, and just inauthentic and fake all the way around. Like, you really should have done more with this. I'm tired of these 80s throwback films that look like films from 2021 or 2022 but with just a, a few 80s bits of clothes and a synth soundtrack and some neon lights and i'm also tired of these indie horror films that just think that having some subtext and having a good idea is enough for the film to be considered acceptable or admirable i'm tired of that too uh it's just a film that in so many different ways should have tried harder and should have been better but as it is it's forgettable you watch it once you never think of it again and that's a damn shame considering all the promise that this concept had but anyway, that is my uh, rant on Censor. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later. See ya.